Good morning, everybody. I'm Srivas Mangalampali, and I'm from this school, Oak Ridge International School. Before I start my speech, there's something I'd like to address. I'd like to thank everyone who made it possible for me to be here today, and everyone who made it possible for me to stand here so that I could talk about this. It, although my friends know me to be a very wordy and loquacious person, having the honor of being able to stand here is something that I just cannot express in words. So thank you once again. What I'll talk about today is what you see is not what you get, which is one of my favorite phrases because it's so versatile. You can put it into any sort of context and it'll have a very beautiful definition. So to try and understand this statement, I decided I would do something different, something to stand out. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break down the statement and define it completely in a different way. So with that, Let's start talking about the statement. What you see is interpretative. It's based off of your ideas and your knowledge of a topic. If you don't have that sort of knowledge or if you have a different sort of knowledge, your conclusions will be completely different. So let's take a look at the internet's favorite dress to try and understand this a little more. And the reason this is called the internet's favorite dress is because it took social media by storm when it made its first appearance in Tumblr in 2016. And everyone was talking about the hashtag blue and black or hashtag white and yellow challenge. But what's the point is people see this in different ways. So what do you guys think? What, what do you see this dress as? Blue and black? Okay, I'd like everyone to keep this in mind as we move on to the next image. I'd like everyone to look at this image for just a couple of seconds and tell me what you think about it. And I want you to think of things like, does it look real? Does it look photoshopped? Is this actually a place on Earth? And why would anyone want to take a picture that looks this bizarre? OK, everyone have your answers? OK, so let's talk about this. Truth is as perceived by you. Whatever you think is the truth, that's the truth for you. But it could be different for someone else even though truth is a material thing. So let's revisit our dress. As you can see, there's three images here. One is the image, the, n the normal image, which is in the center. One, the, sl the one slightly on your right, is um, in the presence of a little more sunlight. And the one on your left, which is darker, has a little less sunlight. Scientif scientific studies have proven that if you assume that this picture was taken in natural daylight, then your brain will ignore shorter, bluer wavelengths, and it'll see the dress as white and yellow. However, if you thought that the lighting was artificial, like a store light, then your brain will ignore the sh longer wavelengths, which are more redder, and you'll see a black and blue image. If you assumed that the lighting was neutral, then you'll see it as a bluish-brown sort of image, which is what it sort of looked like. Now let's revisit our Photoshopped image. It's not Photoshopped, it's a monument and it's an actual monument in a place called Kaipara, New Zealand. This monument is supposed to look like it's not real. It's supposed to look like complete, something completely out of the ordinary. And the pictures that you can see here are some close-up images of the build. So let's try and understand the statement. What you see is not what you get, because what you see has not been what you got so far. To understand this, we'll have to take a look at physiology's favorite experiment, the split brain experiments of 1954. This was conducted by Dr. Roger Sperry, who later was a laureate for, no for the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine. What Dr. Sperry did is he separated the two hemispheres of the brain, the left and the right hemisphere. After the surgery, the patient could, he was functioning normally. He could walk, he could talk, he could eat, but something extraordinary happened. When only the left side of his brain could be seeing things, he could demonstrate how to use everyday objects like pencils and apples, but he didn't know what they were called. When they covered the left side and opened up the right side so that the right eye could see and it would give information to the right side of the brain, they noticed that the patient could name the object, but he couldn't demonstrate how to use it. With this in mind, let's talk about the right side of the brain. And the right side of the brain is called philosophy. I like to call it philosophy because it questions, it reasons, it assumes without much proof, and it debates. 
And all of the philosophical uh, ideas that we have today are based off of thousands of years of human opinions. And to understand this, let's take a look at the opinions of two of the greatest philosophers of all time to see what forms a sort of rostrum for human judgment nowadays. The first one being Plato in Syracuse in around the year 400 BC. He accepted what was called a Parmenidean constraint, which stated that knowledge was unchanging and that you couldn't get more or you couldn't get less. One consequence of that view was that he understood that sensory receptors like eyes, nose, and feeling could not give you knowledge. Even though this was not true, everyone believed it until this person, William of Ockham, showed up almost 1,800 years later and stated that he believed that there were two types of knowledges, natural and supernatural. Natural knowledge was existed when the object existed the person existed, and the person knew that the object existed. So the knowledge was given to the person from the object. Similarly, supernatural knowledge stated that the object did not exist, but the person existed. But for some reason, the person didn't know that the object existed, which stated that the knowledge was given to him by God. So let's try and understand the philosophy and the psychology of the right side of the brain. We can learn that intuitive knowledge looks supernatural. There is no way that I could look at a person and tell them when they were born, which city they were born, and what they had for breakfast this morning. It also explains why many philosophers related it to supernatural uh, occurrences. This sort of perceptive knowledge is formed by first impressions, which is when you observe when you look at a person for the very first time in your life. You look at things like their posture, the way they speak, whether they assert dominance or not, and so on. So now let's move on to the other side of the brain, the left side of the brain. And this side is much more of a reasoning side. So I'd like to ask a question. How many moms are there here? Every single thing that you see on this slide is something that all moms would love to see in their school kid. <laughs> left side dominant school kids are shown to be very good at academics, and they also keep their rooms tidy, which is a plus. They're diligent, they're hardworking, they maintain very good research, and so on, just to name a few. So now, let's understand the left side of the brain. In accordance to the statement, what you see is not what you get. This uh, left side of the brain states simply that you see things with analytic or logical observance. When you see something for the first time, you have some sort of knowledge and some sort of reasoning skill that states that it's giving you power. It's giving you the power to understand and the power to make decisions on your own. In fact, the conclusions that they make are not supposed to be accurate at all, believe me. They're just our brain's way of coming up with conclusions. So now, there's something that we have to ask ourselves here. When we want to interpret the statement as a whole, how do we do it? Do we take into consideration both sides of the brain? Of course we do. The true characteristics of a person can only be seen when both sides of the brain work together. Because the intuitive knowledge is creative, and it's also analytical. Creative knowledge is given to you by the right side of the brain, and it integrates with analytical and logical deductions that you make with the left side of your brain. So now there's two questions that we have to ask ourselves here. First one being, how can we understand this? How can we apply this to our daily life? The second one being a fairly obvious one. Ultimately, we all want to succeed. But what is success? Is it a tangible thing? Is it material? Or is it something that needs to be deduced, just like the statement? To understand this, let's look at the ingredients of success. The first one being passion. Passion is a staple when it comes to the statement. What you see is not what you get, because you need passion. You need passion to work, passion to keep on going, passion to pursue your ambitions and so on. The second one is conviction. Conviction is basically the ideology that you have a good idea, your idea is right, and no one can convince you that you're wrong if you genuinely think your idea is good. But you'll notice that there's some sort of a gap between these two, and that gap is failure. Everyone goes through failure. It's not something that is indefinite. It's not something that is um, exclusive to a specific group of people. In fact, Albert Einstein once said, if you have never failed at anything in your life, then you have never tried anything new. But these are all right side ingredients, so now let's look at left side ingredients. The first one being diligence. 
Diligence and perseverance go hand in hand, which is why perseverance is the next thing in our ingredients of success. You need the diligence to work, the diligence to keep on studying, and you also need the perseverance to not give up at any point of time because of fear of failure. Of course, with both of these comes something that all of us know we have to do, but none of us want to do, sacrifice. We know we have to, at one point of our, in our lives, we're gonna have to sacrifice time, money, anything like spending time with your family or your friends or having fun, but you shouldn't sacrifice all of it because everything is good in moderation. Now the last thing is what I consider the most important, discipline. You need discipline, it's a staple for success because with all other traits and without discipline, there's just no way you're gonna succeed. That's not, that's not how it works. So now, let's think about something. If we want to succeed, we need to let our right brain and our left brain work independently. We need to let our right brain be the motivator in the sense that it should tell you it has passion, it has conviction, and even though there's failure, you can keep on going because you know that you have more knowledge than what, how, how much you did before you failed, which is why the right side of the brain motivates you to keep going. But the left side of the brain is the disciplinarian. It's the one that gives you discipline. It's the one that makes you persevere. It's the one that tells you that e you have to sacrifice your time. But at the end, these two are integrating with each other to form something that is very, very beautiful because at this point of time, I believe that you've reached another level of humanity. You are showing your brain that each part of its brain is good at something. And if it's good at something, then it has to work in that field to make yourself the most productive, most smart, and most intelligent person that you know. So who said success is easy? What do you see when you look at the ingredients? Maybe you see failure, maybe you see discipline, maybe you see sacrifice, but keep in mind that what you see is not what you get. So let's revisit our slide. As you can see here, everything has faded out. And very slowly, but surely, out of everything that you've done, you will reach success. Success is written between the lines of working towards success. Because if you want to be successful, if you keep working and if you follow all of these traits, you will end up being successful. Nobody can convince you otherwise. And this applies to everybody. In fact, it applies to me too. And I have a story to share with all of you. I came to India in 2014 from the United States, and for a very long time in my life, I was a very socially awkward person. I was just that one boy who would sit at the back of the class and occasionally answer a question. But then, my parents and my school introduced me to something called external examinations and talent shows. I understood that at this point of time, I couldn't just wait for someone to tell me, hi, what are you good at? What are your hobbies? What are your interests? What are your talents? I needed to get up there and show the world what I really was. So that year, in sixth grade, I just went all out. I attended every single examination that I could get my hands on, and almost every single time, I returned victorious. Within a matter of months, everybody in the school knew my name, and that record stands to this day. If you were to go to that school and tell them that Srivas Mangalampali is still out there, they would, they, would, they would start going wild. They would start saying, how is he? Is he okay? Is he doing well? Has he changed since the last time I met him? And then I left that school after three years, and I joined this school, Oak Ridge International School. And once again, I was just a shy person who would sit at the back of the class with no way to win friends or influence people. But then I decided I needed to get up and make myself be shown again. I needed to show the world that what they saw in me was not what I really was. I needed to show them that what they saw was not what they would get. So I decided I needed to go and attend more examinations. I needed to go and show everyone that I was a person who could achieve anything that I wanted to if I could just put my heart and mind into it. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I conclude my speech. Thank you.